And so it's like, why would you want to build a faith on something that's not true? You know, my faith is just as strong, and mm-hmm. I have no problem facing the the truth about the manuscripts. It's like, I, I just see a brilliant God, you know, who who mm. who he knew his word was going to be translated into hundreds of languages. And so it couldn't be dependent on the wording in the Greek, the precise wording, because then the whole world, only a little group of people would actually have his word, you know? Mm-hmm. All right, David Brousseau, welcome back to the Anabaptist Perspectives podcast. Good to be back on, Reagan. All right, so we have done a number of episodes with you on various topics, and there's one that you did a uh, some a lecture or something. It's been quite a while ago. I think you might still be able to find it on, on, the, on your website. I'm not sure. And we haven't touched on this one yet just because it is fairly controversial. Okay. But we want to dive into it. So here we here we go. So the, there are some people who claim we can't trust the Bible because ancient manuscripts don't all say the same thing. You know, textual variance yeah. between the different manuscripts, particularly, you okay. know, New Testament say. So then some people will also say, well, therefore, we can't really know what the Bible originally said or what those texts originally meant. Um, you know, a really common one would be like Bart Ehrman or something who says, well, therefore, Christianity is false. And so he leaves Christianity, writes all these books about it. So let's let's jump into this one. And this can get a little sticky. And, and I think we should maybe qualify this with we're not, you know, textual variant, you know, <laughs> right. experts. It's not like we, you yeah. know, study this, you yeah. know, uh, ex- extensively. But there are some some principles here that that I think we should we should tear into. Um, so let's start with saying, well, what exactly are manuscripts? What do biblical scholars mean when they're saying these things? Let's let's lay some groundwork as we dig into this. Okay, so. I think we're talking about New Testament manuscripts um, Mm -hmm. here. So usually the the term is used to mean a handwritten copy of the New Testament. In other words, before the invention of the printing press um, or maybe before Erasmus's uh, edition of the Greek text, which was after the printing press was invented. So when Erasmus put together a Greek text, then it could be printed on printing presses and then people could use it to translate the Bible, which is exactly what they did do. Mm. So before that, uh, monks, I think were mainly the ones who did it, um, but before the monks, it was other Christians, they would sit and hand copy uh, the New Testament, you know, word for word. And of course, what that does, I don't know if you've ever looked at a a copy of a New Testament Mm -hmm. Greek manuscript, it was all run together. They didn't separate their words and they didn't use punctuation. They didn't have sentences. It's all run together. So imagine sitting there and copying the whole New Testament and um, not missing a letter anywhere in there. It would be, I'd say, probably humanly impossible. Now, God, if he had chosen, could have miraculously prevented uh changes from happening, but we know he didn't do that. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, which the New Testament was written entirely in Greek. So we've got 5,000 manuscripts. Now, those are not all complete. So some of them are just like, say, the book of John or Mm -hmm. part of the book of John or something like that. I don't know how many we have of the entire New Testament. It's in the thousands. I'm pretty certain of of that. Mm -hmm. So Let's just say there's, you know, 5,000. When we count the uh, incomplete ones, it's actually closer to 6,000. I I know that much. Mm. So no two read precisely alike out of all of that, Mm. which, again, when we look at how (laughs) what they were working with, that's no surprise. I I mean, I don't I don't know how you could copy all of that and never make a mistake as as a Mm. as a human. And sometimes maybe someone was reading it to you and you're writing it down. And words often will have the same, will sound similarly, but it's two different words. In English, we call them homonyms, mm-hmm. where it's, it sounds the same, but it's spelled differently. It's two mm-hmm. different words. that. So, yeah, so I'm sitting here and you're reading it to me and I hear you say this. I might mm-hmm. misunderstand you. Um, or it might be a case of a homonym, and I write, I write down this word, and you meant that word. So that's how mm-hmm. these variations would come in. So someone says 
this author, I have not read him that will see it shows the Bible can't be of, of God or else it would all read the same. You wouldn't have these variations. Well, this is a remarkable thing. When you think of, like I say, 5,000, you know, or close to 6,000 manuscripts or parts of manuscripts that with all of those little changes, little, you know, goofs, typos, you might say, except they, were, <laughs> they weren't using a typewriter, the message is the same. I mean, there is no doctrine that is changed by any of those variations. I mean, it is the same message no matter which hmm. manuscript you use. So now you tell me if that's not of God, yeah, how do you end up with that? That mm -hmm. you you he lets humans be humans, he allows them to make, you know, little mistakes. And yet, yeah, it, the mistakes are so few mm -hmm. that in the end you don't have several different gospel, several different New Testament messages. It's, you know, hmm. um, so right now I am I use the New King James, okay? It's based on the Texas Receptus, you know, for my New Testament. Hmm. I often, for uh, uh, different reasons, will compare, and I'll use the ESV, the English Standard Version, you know. It is so rare that there is any difference. I'm usually just looking for a difference in translation of how they mm -hmm. express it. But a difference in meaning, that, that almost never exists. And yet they are from two different text families. You know, one's from the critical text, the ESV, mm -hmm. and this is from the Textus Receptus, you know. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, these variations are usually very small. And normally, because we have mm -hmm. this large group, you can usually figure it out and see where, oh, so he's copying and he looked down and when he went back, to the one he was using to copy from, he skipped a line down. He was, you know, his last word was say uh, the, and he looked back down, he saw a the, and he skipped there. And by comparing it with other manuscripts, you can see, oh, he left that sentence out, you know? Mm -hmm. So most of these things, we can, you know, put it back together. Now, do we know word for word how it was originally each of those uh, letters in the New Testament, no, we, we do not know for a certainty that we will talk about the implications mm -hmm. of that. And some Christians would say, oh, we, we do. I think just being intellectually honest, we don't know. Now, the interesting thing is, as you know, my field of scholarship is not New Testament manuscripts. It's the early Christians. Mm -hmm. And they were aware of this. Those variations, the variations we have, the the, the, the large ones, most of them, are, like I say, are just the spelling of a word, spelling of somebody's name, um, a word like maybe it says Lord Jesus here, and then this manuscript just says Jesus. It's like, you know, it doesn't change a single thing. But, um, I mean, it would if this manuscript never has Lord Jesus, but yeah, it does. It's just mm -hmm. in, in that particular sentence, you, you know. These variations, they were all there, uh, the major ones, before the year 200. So interesting. So pretty early on. Okay. Pretty early on. Yeah. I was going to say that was definitely something I wanted to ask is like, well, what did the early church think of this? Yeah. Right. You know, so yeah. what did they say? Like, it's funny just how they think differently than a modern day person. It was like Tertullian will say um, such and such. And you'll say uh, some, some manuscripts say blah, 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 you know. Big deal. So they didn't really make a big deal. Whoa, the, the only one who really got into it and and made a science of it was Origen. He's usually hmm. considered the first um, uh, New Testament manuscript scholar uh, hmm. because he wanted he wanted to see what was the original. He was hoping maybe he could figure out what was the original wording. Mm -hmm. But all he could do was, you know, make a list. Well, these ones read this way, and then these ones read this way. And he he talks a lot about, you know, which one he thinks is correct and and why. He's he's also considered the first textual uh, critic. But it in no way affected his faith. It's like often it's you know a location. It says this town. Another one says this town because it's a word. It's a letter different. Usually, it's just often like a letter uh, mm -hmm. difference. So big deal. What what difference does it make? It doesn't change hmm. the message. So what, you know, maybe, I don't know if there was a time in my life that knowing these variations stumbled me. I think from childhood, I think from when I was very little, I, I knew that these mm. manuscripts differed. So mm. I, I don't think it ever came as a shock mm. to me. But I have wondered, well, why did God allow this? Like I say, he didn't allow it to 
change any doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, but as I pondered it more, and this is human reasoning, so I may be totally misguessing the thing, you know, but if he had preserved it perfect, let's say, you know, each of these Greek manuscripts read exactly the same, or we actually had Paul's original. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was preserved somehow in a cave and, and we knew for certain this was it, you know. Mm -hmm. So we knew beyond a doubt this is how this uh, book of the New Testament originally read. Okay, what that would create would mean it's only God's word if you read it in Greek. Mm. Because the minute you translate it, you have to change something. There are no, no two languages that you that are word for word. Mm -hmm. You know, this language has this word and this language has the exact same word. There are no two languages where yeah. you can do that. So anytime you translate, you automatically have to make decisions, choices. What word should I use to translate this Greek mm -hmm. word, etc. So then you'd have a situation that that is God's word, but the minute you translate it, it's not God's word. Whoa. Okay. So that's that's fascinating because that's one of the cornerstones of something like, say, Islam. Exactly. So if you pick up a, a copy of the Quran and it's in English, it won't say it's a translation. It will call it a commentary because they know, oh, it's been translated. Right. So therefore, it's not the original because in their doctrine, it would be this is – Every, I mean, exactly yeah. what you know, that. Allah handed down, and you cannot translate. You can't change it. Yeah, I, I never thought that of that, but that makes a lot of sense. That I, I can see what you're saying because knowing human nature, I can imagine people doing the same yeah. thing. If you it, had it, an original, it, it, it of, would. Yeah, and, okay. And that happened with me with the, the Quran. Whoa. I was uh, speaking at. Um, it was a small group of students at uh, Penn State. It was on um, how we know God exists. And mm. anyway, uh, several of the people who attended were uh, Muslim because mm. uh, they were interested in hearing uh, proofs for God's existence, the same as, you know, Christians are. So afterwards, um, oh, well, before it started, I was looking around. They have a building there that's like a, a religious building. It's got Buddhists and it's got, you know, uh, you know all, everything. And so I saw there in the hall, there was a stack of Korans, you know, in English. And, you know, they were to hand out. So I helped myself to one. And I had it there, and it was just on a stack. I had a notebook and, and everything. So anyway, during the lunch break or whatever, I'm talking to this guy, and he says he's he's uh, Muslim, and and suddenly we mentioned the Quran, and I look down, and I know in Islam, if you've got a Quran, it's got to be the highest book mm -hmm. in in the room, you know. And here I have it down under you know my Bible and yeah. and then some notebooks and everything, and I immediately said, oh, I'm sorry that if that's offensive to you, I, yeah, I didn't mean to be offensive. He said, "That's no problem. That's not the Quran. That's just a English, you know, Ooh, translation." Oh, interesting. And and yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. So yeah, this isn't the Bible. If if we had Paul's original in Greek, well, this isn't the Bible. This is just a translation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you would have to. But it gets more complicated. You'd have to know New Testament Greek, but you'd have to know it as a native speaker. I mean, you can study it now, but there's nobody today who speaks Koine Greek the way somebody did in the first century. You know, mm -hmm. there's, they study it as a second language, mm -hmm. but there's a big difference between being a native speaker and um, somebody who's learning it, particularly wow. 2,000 years later. So we would still not know exactly what Paul meant because the language has changed over the years and we'd have to be, have to be guessing. But it would mean everybody to share the gospel, yeah, they've got to learn Koine <laughs> Greek Huh. And see, that's not what God wanted. So the Bible is a book that from, I mean, the earliest, it got translated into Latin. We were talking about that in an earlier session, how the Latin translation of the Bible, one of the verses, they, they mistranslated a, um, a couple words there. And, you know, we can correct it now, but it, it affected um, uh, some doctrine in that translation. So translations are, are imperfect, but it got translated right away. They never thought like, okay, the Greek is this magical language. No, we, it got translated into Aramaic right away. Hmm. It wasn't too long before it was in Coptic and then Armenian and, and, and so on. I mean, that hmm. was a mindset from the beginning. This gets translated. We don't worship the words on the page. We worship the message. And so God's word is his message. It's not the exact precise words. Mm. And so that's my choice. So I think it's why he didn't want any of those manuscripts mm. 
to read exactly the same because he's trying to get across to us, dude, it's the message <laughs> that I want mm. you to focus on. Don't be worshiping these words. Mm. And yet I didn't, I didn't allow enough change in there that you have to worry about is maybe the message is different. Mm -hmm. No, the message is the same mm -hmm. in, in all the manuscripts. So mm -hmm. yeah, God's, God's, um, his, his ways are just always, you know, smarter than ours <laughs> and things that we think, because I always thought, well, if I was God, I, I would have preserved that. And yeah, he saw the trap that that would have created. Now, this is my answer. And, you know, I may get to heaven and say, Dave, you got that all wrong. <laughs> this is the reason I didn't do this. So so this is just, you know, how I thought through the, the mm -hmm. problem and realized it wasn't a problem. Mm. And so the ones like the King James only people and, and, you know, I'm using the new King James. When I did the Romans commentary, we were talking about that. I actually used the, the King James because there's a copyright issue with the New King James. They, they will not let you use it for a commentary unless you get written permission and pay them, you know, some kind of royalty or something like that. So I had to go back to the original King James and I did that with the Matthew commentary and then with the, the Romans. And I really grew in respect for the King James. I mean, those translators did a tremendous job mm. Now, I'm not into archaic English. You know, I didn't grow up with the King James. And so the archaic English is, yeah, I don't enjoy wrestling with it. But as far as their, they weren't um, inerrant. Now, some King James mm. people would want to make the King James inerrant. The problem is we have several editions of the King James. You know, it was 1611, but then I think there was one in 1614. And the one that's usually used today is from, uh, mm. The 1700s, and then it's been you know changed mm -hmm. a little bit. There's one from the 1800s yes, as well. Yeah, 1800s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, which mm -hmm. one? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's going to depend on every little word or or something like like that. But if it's the message, it doesn't matter. But I do want a Bible translation that is not loose. I don't like paraphrases. I don't mm -hmm. like where they say, "Well, we're translating it thought for thought." Well, you don't necessarily know Paul's thought. When you say thought for thought, what you mean is what I think Paul was saying, and that's what I'm translating. Well, just, hey, give me the words and let me do the interpreting. You know, mm -hmm. don't don't you do the interpreting for me. Just how did Paul say it, you know? And so I like the King James. It's fairly literal. You know, the ES ESV does a good job, too. They claim to be more literal than the King James. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. That's a subjective thing. I would say the King James is more literal just from working with the two and look, mm. looking at them. But I do appreciate a more literal translation. So, yeah, the King James is great in that regard. I'm not knocking it. Mm -hmm. But to imagine that those translators had the precise Greek manuscript because it's based on uh, Erasmus made three different Greek New Testaments. So he Okay. So we're, what's the, this is Texas Receptus we're talking yeah. about now, yes, right? Yes, we're which, talking about Texas so Receptus. Okay. Texas Receptus manuscript, which is the Corne Greek New Testament, which you can still buy it, you know, today. Right. Um, that's the, that's what the King James is based on, right? Just right. to make sure we got, okay, make sure I got our context yeah. here. Okay. And, and Texas Receptus is, is, is an inflated name. It sounds like, oh, the received text or something like that. Yeah. It's yeah. just, so Erasmus, like I say, you had these handwritten ones and he wanted to, to, get a, a Greek text and have it printed. And, um, but when he went to do it, he only had like two good manuscripts to work from and they were pretty late. I mean, like, I, I couldn't tell you the exact year, but let's say the 1300s and 1200s, something like that, a long, mm -hmm. a long ways removed from when the Bible was written. And I think somebody else was working on getting one printed too. And so he was in a somewhat of a rush. I want to get this out before this other person mm -hmm. does. So he took these two, but uh, he neither one of them had the the last part of Revelation in them, and so he had he then took the Latin Vulgate, uh, which is a Latin translation, and he took the Latin and translated it, it back into Greek, so he could you know make a Greek manuscript. Hmm. Um, he also took a passage in Acts that's not in any Greek manuscript. I mean, any you know we we, we mentioned there's over five thousand. None of them have this particular sentence, it's not theologically important in Acts, but it was in the Latin Vulgate that Catholics were used to reading. So he stuck it in there, even though there is no Greek manuscript that, that has that, you know? <laughs> no way. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> that, well, wow. then he revised it. There was a second edition, and that's what, if 
and don't on on any of this. I'm going by memory, so I may have you know something sure. a little bit on. If my memory serves me correct, it was his second edition that Luther used, and that Tin, I think Tyndale maybe used. Um, okay. But Luther, I'm I'm almost certain used his second edition, and then the third one is the one that the King James is based on. So okay. yeah, it's. So, so for, so, I mean, since you brought it up, right, we can just plow right into this King James only thing, okay. because I know people will be like, oh, you know, what is, what does David Bristow think about that? Right. And, and again, it's not something we've talked about on the podcast before, but essentially for someone who would say King James only, you would have to say that Erasmus was inspired when he put that manuscript together? Am, am I tracking correct? Or is that, I mean, that feels like a pretty, um, pretty um, uh, gargantuan yeah. claim. You'd have to, to claim make. and then you'd have to decide. So which of the three was he inspired on? Hmm. So if the King James Whew. is the inspired one, then Luther's is not because, you know, one was made from his third, the King James, if I've got it right. And one Oof. was made from his second. Yeah. So you're having to say it wasn't. What about Tyndale? What about Wycliffe? What about I mean, what do you start doing with all of this if you're saying, well, this is the Bible Mm -hmm. and that? The other thing is, if the King James were, and I'm just talking about the New Testament now, were the exact Bible, Mm -hmm. we would have to say there is no Greek manuscript in existence anywhere in the world that has the New Testament in it because there is no Greek manuscript that reads exactly like the Textus Receptus. It was a confilation of several manuscripts. Oh, oh, I see, I see what you're saying. So it's not like it exists as a whole. He's yeah, there, pulling there's, together There is pieces. no single manuscript that reads like the Textus Receptus. Oh, so you have, you have to say it got lost. And like you say, you're going to have to say Erasmus was inspired by God, who hmm. usually the King James people don't like Erasmus, but you'd have to say he was inspired <laughs> by God mm-hmm. to find the exact right ones and put them together precisely correctly to get the original wording. Whew. Yeah. You know? Wow. So, but, but see, here's, okay. So one of the challenges though, is people don't like ambiguity necessarily. Um, and yes. I, I'm saying this very broadly speaking, yeah, but I you know, know I, I have interacted quite a bit with, with some people in the King James only uh, world. Um, so, well, let me just read the, one of the questions here. I think I right. have it written better than, than I can say it. But right. um, So some people would insist that, that this kind of textual variation that we're talking about means we don't have reliable access to God's teaching in Scripture. So those basically kind of attempting to deny the historical complexity that's involved in the New Testament text. Um, but then you could flip it around and say that there are liberals or skeptics who claim that the Bible was drastically changed, so then we can't know what it really said either. Um, and so how do we respond to those concerns? It's kind of like you have two wildly opposite extremes where, like, you know, say, Bart Ehrman on one side is like, I'm going to leave Christianity because there's variation yeah. in these manuscripts. All the way on the way other side, you have someone saying, if it's not the King James, it's not God's word. Or yeah. whatever. Take your pick of whatever yeah. it was said. yeah. What ends up, what what scares me or what worries me is a young person hearing that, it'd be pretty easy to get pulled around with those extremes. And I could, well, I actually just heard of one, you know, just within the last week of a young person who walked away from Christianity because they heard some of this stuff from, oh, this is the only, like, they're, they're, like, this is the true word of God. And then they ran into some of the stuff from Bart Ehrman and says, well, there are some variations. And it threw them for a loop and they couldn't handle that because they had been told, like, there can't be any variation. And then when they were shown, here's some variation in these manuscripts, they left, they lost their faith right. um, over that. So how do we – yeah. it's kind of a long, convoluted question, but how do we w- wrestle with these two pretty it's opposite r- extremes? Thing, yeah. You know? So, yeah, certainly the answer isn't like a parent who tells their children there's a Santa Claus, <laughs> you know, and then when the child gets older and realizes there isn't, then they don't mm. trust their parent. You know, you tell mm-hmm. them the, the <laughs> truth. I mean, I mean, I don't think we get into Santa <laughs> Claus, but... But that's a, that's a fitting, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you're honest with your children and if pastors are honest with the congregation and if we as a people are honest about things, then you don't have that happen. Like I say, I think I knew from the time I was a little boy that there were variations. So it never was an, an hmm. issue to me because... Yeah, I wasn't told, oh, we have the exact thing. And then later I found out we we didn't. Just, hey, just be honest from the start. Now, in answer to the other one, well, we don't know what's true. Well, see, it shows there was no collusion. I mean, if you had 
5,000 manuscripts and the word exactly the same, it would certainly look like people got in a back room and, and you know, <laughs> let's make sure this is this. <laughs> you know, when they vary and yet the message doesn't vary, then, yeah, it shows that, okay, we can know what the message was because we have all of these independent witnesses. The fact that they don't read precisely the same shows that they're independent, and yet the message is the same throughout them. The variations are so insignificant mm -hmm. that, hey, it, it does show we can rely on, on the message. And again, because it doesn't depend upon the exact wording, we can translate it into, you know, languages that are really different than Greek, you know, like, you know, some language on an island somewhere, let's say in the South Pacific that, you know, it's from a different language family that doesn't even have any roots the same with Greek, but you can still translate it because it's the message, but the words are going to be, you know, very different. Mm -hmm. But the, see, this, the thing that is so silly about that is we have over 40,000 denominations and sects and you know, these independent mega churches and all of that. And the majority of them were around when everyone used the King James. So in other words, oh. <laughs> what difference does it make even if you had the precise Bible, hmm. if people interpret it differently? It's not going to change how you <laughs> interpret it. You're huh. still going to have... So uh, unless we have yeah. Paul with us to say that this is how you should interpret it, we're still in the same situation because mm -hmm. the variation isn't because they use different translations. It's because they interpret the existing one different. Even oh. Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, now they have this, you know, their own translation and stuff. But when they started, they were using the King James. That really? Was, yeah, that was their Bible and their doctrine all was developed using the King James. So, so maybe this is a bit of a... Um a smokescreen or, 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 or something. I don't know. I'm trying to think of the right terminology. If we get fixated on, oh, there can't be any variation in manuscripts when really you're saying, Hey, you know, there's a lot of diversity just in humans interpreting things differently. Huge I mean, amount <laughs> of variation. I honestly, I hadn't really thought about that before. That makes a lot of sense though. And then, and also with translation, you know, yeah. so, um, huh. it, it's, like I say, we need to focus that God's word is his message. It's not the exact thing. And yet mm -hmm. there's so little variation, even with 5,000 plus manuscripts, that we can be confident what we have is very similar to what the apostles wrote. And, and so that, you know, to me is comforting. One reason I use, you know, the uh, I use the New King James because, again, I, archaic English is not, I didn't grow up with it, is it's the fullest. So with all these manuscripts, um, some of them contain incidents, like the woman who was caught in adultery has become really famous. None of the early Christians mentioned that incident. Really? And none of the early Bible— Interesting. None of the, the earliest manuscripts don't mention it, Okay. Uh, hmm. It's now become one of the most popular because people like Jesus saying, you know, um, you know, whoever has no sin cast the first stone. We, we like that part. And I'm, you know, I don't know. But what I like about the Texas Receptus or the majority text right now, there's a group of Anabaptists working on translating the Bible using the majority text. Interesting. Wait, is, is that similar to Texas Receptus? Very similar. Very similar. Okay. So the Texas Receptus would be in the majority text family. It's just it's taking a few of those manuscripts and it's based on that where the majority text would be taking the large group and saying, how did, ah. how did the majority read? And the majority doesn't always follow the Texas Receptus. Mm. There's so little variation, it doesn't matter. But the nice thing with the majority text or the Texas Receptus is, let's say that, that that wasn't originally part of the Bible, but the woman caught in adultery. It might still be a true account. In other words, it may be a true mm. narrative. It just wasn't originally in... Uh, John's gospel, but it was true. And so somebody added it later. So how does that change my Christian, how I live from day to day? It doesn't change anything. What is it? How does it change my view of salvation or my view of the Trinity or the view of anything? It has no effect on it, you know? And that's one of the larger things that there's, I mean, usually it's just, you know, one word that's, that's different. Mm -hmm. That's a whole episode, but even something that large, and that's probably the, the largest, you know, single episode, yeah. 
it makes no difference in how we live as as Christians. That, that's the irony of it, that people worry about all of these things mm-hmm. that don't affect how we live, don't affect, you know, the fundamentals of Christianity. But I was saying, so in, with the majority text or the Texas Receptus, okay, it may have some things in there that weren't in the original. I don't know, but I can feel fairly confident that I have everything that was there. I may have a little bit more <laughs> than was there, <laughs> but I've got it all. Nothing's missing. Mm-hmm. Whereas with some of the others like who don't have that in there, mm-hmm. well, maybe they're missing it, and maybe that was part of it. But usually the other Bibles, they put it in, and then just say the early manuscripts don't have that. So either way, you read it. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, I should, maybe that's going to stumble someone that I brought that up. Mm-hmm. But again, hey— we should be on truth is never something a Christian should be afraid of, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if we create these fake things, then when we're hit with truth, it's going to stumble Mm us. So we're talking about the Texas Receptus and the King James. So um, I know when we were talking in, um, in private, you were mentioning that you grew up reading Jack Chick tracks and, and things. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) um, And I've read, I've had them handed to me, Jack Chick tracks on the uh, Texas Receptives and, yep. and the King Why James. Why the King yeah. James is the, the, the only oh, yeah, he's Bible. Got a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, my. But yeah. this one of them, one of his, and Jack Chick was brilliant. I mean, I dislike his dishonesty and stuff, but if there's a Jack Chick track there, I'm likely to pick it up. Sorry. You know, he knew how to, that people are drawn to animation, you, you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you just pick them up. I mean, you know, I, I, I will give, you know, give him his due that that he mm-hmm. he was a genius at communicating truth u- using that. The problem was he did not have a high standard of I'm only going to put out what I know is true. And he, I mean, a lot of his stuff he just makes up absolute lies, and he does on the one about the Texas Receptus. So mm-hmm. I was reading it; it was given to me, and according to it, okay, the the early Christians had this, uh, and and they had the real Bible. Okay. Now, it's interesting because, like I say, when you read the early Christians, you find all of these variations are there before the year 200, or, or nearly all of them. Yeah, I, did, I did not know that. That is interesting. Anyways, oh, sorry, okay. continue. And, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and so then when Constantine created the Catholic Church and all that, then the true Christians, they went and they had the, the original manuscripts and they hid them in a cave, okay? And, and you know, they kept watch so that that would be preserved. And then the Waldensians got that, and then they translated the Bible you know, from the real thing. And then that's also what, you know, came down to the King James. Well, that is an absolute lie. Nothing like that happened. Absolutely nothing like that happened. And the what is so absurd is we have the Waldensian Bible. I mean, it's still around and it doesn't follow the Texas Receptus. I mean, it's like, <laughs> Interesting. it's like, this is so absurd. Wow. You're, just, you're just lying. You, ha- you don't even care about the truth. So, when people are moved to that extent that I've got to believe uh, this and I will lie to do it, well, then that should tell you then, okay, there's something seriously wrong. Because hmm. when we have the actual truth, then we're not scared of new facts that go against it, you know? Mm-hmm. And we don't make up lies to try to cover them and, and all of that. We just look things in in the face. And the like I say, to me, the good news is that, wow, I can be very confident when I read the New Testament that I'm reading God's word, you know, and there may be a question about, you know, uh, you know, the the woman caught in adultery or something like that. And it doesn't make one lick of difference on what I, you know, practice, what I believe about God and and any of the fundamentals of of the faith. And whether it was in John's account, it could still be an absolutely true story, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it could still Mm -hmm. be true. And let's just say it's, you know, someone made up a, a good sounding story. Okay. Hasn't done me any harm either, you, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's actually just looking at the truth and not being scared of it has, you know, definitely worked to my favor. And of course I would have discovered all that the minute I started reading the early Christians, I would have noticed, wow, mm-hmm. they quote these things a lot of different ways, you mm-hmm. know, they weren't the least bit bothered by that, you know, it's just like, but that's that's so interesting though, because so many people are bothered by that now, you know. Because like if you if you grow up in a church setting that's like this is God's word, and you're never told that there's any kind of variation in the Greek and all this stuff, and then let's say you go take a college course or whatever, yeah. and the professor says, "Oh, and by the way, da da da, this," you know, that could be extremely disorienting, yeah. Y- you know, and so it, how how do we? 
how how do we walk through that? Like how? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like this could be kind of a real challenge, actually, like for for pastors and and people looking into this. And well, like, yeah, yeah honestly, just, I, I just feel like I'll just say it again. You know, a Christian should never have to be afraid of the of the truth. And if we mm-hmm. if we start from the beginning of being honest and and having a high regard for intellectual and spiritual honesty, then we don't get into these things where, like I say, I hope you don't get a bunch of people angry with you. But if they are, it's like, so what are you angry about? Do you have some facts that are different than what we've just shared here tonight? I can guarantee you they don't. They'll have Jack Chick tracks and they'll have some <laughs> books you know, published by him and by other people. They will have no facts that are that are different. And so it's like, why would you want to build a faith on something that's not true? You know, my faith is just as strong, and mm-hmm. I have no problem facing the the truth about the manuscripts. It's like, I, I just see a brilliant God, you know, who who mm-hmm. who he knew his word was going to be translated into hundreds of languages. And so it couldn't be dependent on the wording in the Greek, the precise wording, because then the whole world, only a little group of people would actually have his word, you know, mm-hmm. um, and would have to be trying to get all these people to learn Greek, including David Berceau, you know, and, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> and I've studied it, but wow, I, it's, I'm, I, I don't take to it easily. That's, that's for sure. It's, it's, uh, um, so yeah, I appreciate that God made his word. So it, there's enough flexibility that the message can be translated uh, into different languages, and it's still God's word because it's still His message. Unless somebody just really messes with it, like I say, I don't like these these paraphrases. Now that I have a big problem with, you know, give me God's word, translate it. Yes, you might have some errors in your translation, but at least try to translate it fairly mm-hmm. literally. You can't tra- translate it absolutely literally, but but as literal as possible. And yeah, then let me work from there. Mm-hmm. And it's nice that we have several translations. Well, not, I mean, we have hundreds of them, but we have mm-hmm. good ones we can compare and and see. And, and oh, okay, that can often shed light. And like I say, I also like looking at how the early Christians quoted things and how they understood the Greek, because often it is very different than, than even the King James. I mean, uh, there's things in the King James that are well, I, you know, working on the Romans commentary, do we have time to go into this? Yeah, yeah, go, go for so it. So I'm yeah. working on it, and this really surprised me, because like I said, I really have a lot of respect for for the King James translators, and, you know, I was I was using them and comparing with the early Christians, and, you know, it just, yeah, this is great, how the King James has it, you know, and I would compare sometimes the NIV or something, it's like, no, the King James translators got it right, you know, because this is how the early Christians are understanding it. And I can't quote it, uh, the chapter and verse, but in there, um, Paul says that he's quoting actually from, I think it's Isaiah, that uh, God would make a short word on the earth, okay, is what he says. But the King James says he would make a short work on the earth, okay? Now, okay, that sounds That's... more reasonable than word, it's short yeah. work, and it's like, I'm reading the early Christians and they're saying word and they they go into an explanation. There's no, you know, wondering, did they maybe just, is that just a typo? Because they talk about what that word is. You know, it's the gospel, that it's a short thing compared to the law that has all these commandments and the gospel is very short. So the short word was the the gospel. Um, And it's like the King James has work, okay? I I look (laughs) at the text, I look at the text and it's the Greek word, uh, there is logos, which is word. It's not Aragon, which is work. And it's like, what in the world? You had it right Whoa. in front of you and you changed it. Now, then I looked at the Tyndale, which was before the King James. It has short word. I looked at Geneva. All the ones before the King James have word. The Wycliffe, they all have word. And then the King James translators put work in there. And it's like, why did you guys do this? Now, the funny thing is, then when you go to modern ones that, that they say a fresh translation from the Greek, then they have short work. It's like no way. Yeah, I'm really? Not kidding. Like I'm not wh- kidding. like which ones? Do you know of any off the top of your head? 
I'm pretty sure the NIV, ESV, I think. No way. Yeah, t- check them out. I Hold mean, up. All right. Well, just, this is very important. Um, oh, do we have any idea which chapter verse this is? Oh, yeah, that's right. No, oh, you'd have man. to have a thing there. Someone's going to dig it up in the comments. Yeah, someone. And, um, maybe I can well, send it no, to you hold, hold in on. the comments. Let's, 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 do it. Let's, do a quick, uh, let's do a quick search here because, I mean, this is so my, way my, yeah, too important Yeah, my point was here. criticism. It's just that don't think that these translators were infallible. Just... Hey, they did an admirable job, but they were not infallible. You know, they they wow. uh, changed things, not just there. There were several other things. I thought, well, you just changed it. There's no reason to change it. It's, I don't think it's a typo. It's just you thought this doesn't Oof. make sense, and so we're going to change this. Okay, but but see, I can just see the comments coming through already. Like someone is going to still find a way to defend that <laughs> and, be, and be like, the King James is still the right. When you get that way, comment— like, Forward it to me because I'd like to see. (laughs) (laughs) I want them to go to the the Texas Receptus Mm -hmm. where it says word there, logos. And yeah, explain that to me how that can mean work. Okay. That I would like to see. I'd like to see someone defend that. All right. If if, (laughs) if you're a King James only person or something who would like to, because I would love, yeah, because I know that there are cases like that. I I have a friend who does some stuff with Greek and blah, blah, blah. And they say, oh, yeah, there, there are different points where it's just like, oh, yeah, they just – they kind of messed up there. Like you can read in the Greek. It's like, yeah, yeah it pretty clearly means this and they – you know, they just yeah. – and some of that is, you know, maybe it was a mistake. Maybe it was this, that, whatever. But it was just interesting because yeah. if you grow up hearing this is God's word and then if you have someone later on tell you, oh, yeah, they, they messed up there, that, depending on who you are, could actually rattle you because yeah. if you're not taught this stuff. So anyway, that's yeah. kind of what I was like. I feel yeah. like this is an important enough topic. You know, we're going to dive into and, it. And, and it is. Yeah. And, and it's not, again, somebody who has been raised with the King James is, and is using it, hey, fine. Again, right. I, I, I'm mm-hmm. saying, I think it is great. Now, personally, you know, working on these commentaries, when I do see something different than what's in our, you know, like say the King James or New King James and all like that, then I, I always go back to trying to figure out why is it different. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, I haven't done this with the whole New Testament, so I can't say that this rule applies equally. I have personally found that more often than not, Wycliffe translates it more similar to the early church than anyone after him. So you have Wycliffe, which is the oldest English translation. Interesting. And I have personally found it to be the most accurate, even though he didn't translate from Greek, he translated from Latin. No way. And, yeah. And it's that's really fascinating. I know. And I was always told how terrible, you know, that was. And then hmm. Tyndale usually is better than the King James. And he's, you know, he's earlier. So it seems like, and then the King James is almost always better than the NIV. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it is interesting. That's just what, what I have found going back, you know, and, and so hmm. I like if it matters, but these things only mattered because I was doing a commentary and I, 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 you know, I had to discuss it. I had the, the, the running text had to fit the comments from the early Christians, you know, mm-hmm. and when what they were saying didn't fit the text of the King James or, or whatever, then, then I, that's when I started digging. It's like, well, okay, so why are they saying something different here? Yeah. That, I mean, and that then I would wild. find out, oh, they're following the Greek. And for some reason, the King James changed it or, or wh- whomever. That's, that is, that is just bizarre. But like, it's, again, it is a small percentage. I mean, you know, I don't, when I read the the King James, I don't normally feel like, oh, I better check this, make sure it's right. Mm-hmm, you know, right. It's, it's, it's a very small percentage, but it's enough. I think that we should be honest. Look, these guys were not infallible. They, they were very yeah. dedicated, very learned, but they were not infallible. And for mm-hmm. us as Anabaptists, I never understood this coming in when I saw these people, King James only. It's like, now, wait a minute. One of the key teachings of the Anabaptists was you cannot have a state church. That's wicked, that a state church Mm. is automatically corrupt. Well, the King James Bible was a state Bible. It was commissioned by King James. Oh, And it was done with (laughs) his permission, with his backing, with his money, the state money. And Hmm. it was made the official, the only Bible allowed in the English churches. So it was a state Bible. So it's like, hmm. so why would we as Anabaptists latch on to a state Bible, a Bible that's the product of a state church? Now, hmm. again, I use it because it's, it's like I say, an admirable translation, or I use a modernized version of it, but it's like, I, I don't worship it as the Bible because 
if God did give us the Bible that we have it absolute, he wouldn't do it through a state church. I mean, unless he wants us, unless unless we're all wrong as Anabaptists and that God wants a state church, you know, I don't think he would work that way. So it is an odd thing, you know, that Anabaptists well, ought to st step back and like, yeah, well, we. That's, that's, a, that's kind of a good point. Like, yeah, maybe we should kind of, whoa, okay, step back. Look at some of the broader context that's going on. Also, uh, when, before we were recording this and we were talking through this episode and things, you'd mentioned, well, it's like also to keep in mind, the Anabaptist movement had been going on for like 90 years before the King James translation even existed. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, it's not even part of our story as a people, which it, it is, is fascinating. Which, what would have they read, just out of curiosity? Luther's. Okay, Luther's translation. Interesting. So that's what the Amish use today is is Luther's Bible. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, the Anabaptists. I mean, they were still doing German services, you know, well into the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they didn't start using the King James until you know the last half of the 1800s. So it's like this is very new in our movement, and now mm -hmm. we're already worshiping it as the infallible Word of God. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, mm -hmm. our people were using Luther's Bible for centuries before we started even using the, the King James. Yeah, wow. This this is just this is this is a an, an interesting story with a lot of different pieces kind of weaving together. And there's so many different things in even like the psychology involved in it and how people perceive the Bible and, and uh, wow, it, yeah, it's kind of a lot to think about. And I'm really curious what the responses are going to be for starters. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 I think one of the takeaways from this is is maybe taking a step back from some of our biases and actually looking at more of the context. It feels like that's what you've been doing a lot with comparing with some of these other earlier, like yes. pre-King James, and then even some of the stuff with where the Texas Receptus comes from. That was interesting. I didn't, I hadn't really thought about some of that before. Yeah, that's really good. I, What is a piece you would want to leave our audience with when we think about these things? Because they are going to run into this, I'm sure, the variations between different manuscripts, and people will probably be out there trying to convince them, therefore, Christianity is not real, or therefore, King James only, or whatever yeah. the case may be. There's lots of ideas and opinions. What's something you can that we can leave our audience with? Let's leave them on solid ground. Yeah, so years ago, wow, um, about 18 years ago, I was, I was sharing a message at uh, with a group of people uh, in California, and it got into Bible manuscripts, and I thought I was sharing something that they would enjoy. I did not know they were King James only, okay? <laughs> okay. Wow, did I jump into a hornet's nest? <laughs> and one of the brothers, I mean, he stood up and said, I want to be able to tell my daughter, you know, show her the Bible, and say, this is God's word. I want to be able to do that, you know? And so I think the message that I would want to leave with our listeners is you can't do that. You can pick it up whether it is the New King James or the King James or the Tyndale or the Wycliffe and say, this is God's word because God's word is the inspired message that is in there and that you can change a word or two here and there. You can translate it differently differently. It's still God's word. Yeah, you can't corrupt it. I think some of the translations do corrupt it. But as long as you are being relatively faithful to the manuscripts, it is God's word. It is a message that is as was prophesied. It's a short word. You know, his, mm -hmm. his, his message to us didn't depend on all these words. We have them. We have things that often we can't understand, like, like Romans, you know, that, have, <laughs> that have, you know, people have gone in, in different directions. But yeah, God's word is there, and it's really a relatively simple message. And I think actually most Christians, you know, get that, that, yeah, it's, we don't have to understand all of that, and it doesn't depend on all these verses. It really does come down to a few things. So yeah, this should not weaken someone's faith unless they've been told something that's false. I mean, always tell your people the truth. And yeah, we can be confident. When I pick it up and read it, I, I have every bit of feeling. I am reading the Word of God, even though I know I'm reading a human translation. And yes, a word or two may be wrong, but the message is not going to be wrong. Hmm. That's that's powerful. Yeah. And I hope people after listening to this can can come away with a lot of new information and not like you're saying, don't be afraid to to look at the truth of these things. Because 
you, I'm sure they're going to run into it, you know, like I did. You know, I went, I was in my library and, oh, here's a book about Bible manuscripts. And it was by Bart Ehrman. Yeah. And he's here saying, oh, you shouldn't believe in Christianity because of these variations. And fortunately, I didn't go down that street. But, you know, maybe somebody else will, you know, and that's unfortunate. And hopefully we can give them the, some tools that they can still trust and, yes. you know, have faith in what God has preserved. And if any of this has bothered them, now here's where they can do a lot of digging that there are a lot of books written out there by Bible believing Christians who acknowledge that there's these manuscripts mm. who don't who don't lie, who none of this has upset them. You know, who, I mm. mean, you can go and dig this out for your for yourself. Very few people have walked away from God because of that. Now, even that person who says that's the reason I really wonder. My own experience has usually been the hypocritical conduct of Christians hmm. has caused people, if they're going to turn away, it's, yeah, that's it more than, hmm. oh, it's because, of, you know, there's various manuscripts. I'd say very few have been stumbled over that. A whole lot of people have been stumbled by Christians hmm. who don't walk in the teachings of Christ. So I think that's what we really need to focus on. Hmm. That's that's a powerful one to to leave with is... We can get fixated on manuscripts and this little variation here and there, but you keep bringing it back to what's the message that this text, this the Bible, is telling us, and then how do we live that out? How do we be gracious and humble and love our neighbors and all of these other things, too, that's so easy to forget when we want to um, insist on our way, I guess? Yes, um, amen. Yeah. yeah. That's that's a powerful piece to leave us with, and I, <laughs> I just want to say thanks for coming on yeah. and being willing to tackle this topic it's, because it's, it's controversial. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's been enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Thanks for listening to this episode with David Brousseau. If you found this interesting, you might want to check out the episode we did with him on the Septuagint and some of the differences between it and other Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. You can find that episode linked in the description below. Also, consider signing up for our monthly email newsletter, which you can subscribe to on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.